able to make it. He was having uh, some difficulties logging in uh, on his uh, uh, PC, on his Mac. Um, so, you know, uh, let, let's just play it by ear. Don't, don't worry, it'll all be great. Yeah, it will. Absolutely. I absolutely believe so. Yes? Yeah, I can. I, I have no idea of the time, so I don't know how. What is where? Hello, Agustin. 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 Hello, can I ask you to be the, the timekeeper? Sure. Yeah, because I cannot see with it, you know, and I get, uh, I, when I start talking, I get lost. So, Brendan, when, when it is like that, where are, where are you, Brendan? You keep moving. Okay, Brendan, when we are half an hour on the, on the panel, can you please wait me like that? Right? So that means half an hour, so I know how to plan the time. Right, yep. and I will, I will, I will also do like that. So it means I have seen you, right? Yep. If I, if I don't reply, you keep waving because it means I haven't seen you, right? Okay. You know me, you know me. When I start talking, I can spend days and, and days talking, so, <laughs> right? So you need, you need to be the timekeeper. Okay, so no. we are going to start going to the gallery, right? And then as people are coming, uh, you send them their keys. Oh, who stays here? Who stays here to bring people in? Uh, okay. Um, we should have. Let me just uh, message in Discord and see if I can get off. Okay, okay. Come on. Hey, Nicole. Um, yeah. Well, Hi, what, Brendan. What you can do if you want, um, anytime, you know, you can, um, you're on my Instagram now, just shoot me a message and um, I can give you a, a tour of the room. Yeah, it would be good if it's somebody, in case some people come later. Yeah, we're still, you got lost a couple. Yeah, so I start in going, and I think we are going to room, uh, shall we go to room three, Keith, or what? No, 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 okay, fine, okay, 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 I get it, okay. So I'm going to start going in, Nicole and Agustin, if you want to follow me. Uh, Peter have been hanging there all day, I don't know, <laughs> in the computer, yeah, and, and Nicole, we are going to start going inside if you want to call, otherwise, so I'm going to start going there. So when I was in Berlin at a show, I just... Okay. Hello, who is this one? Hey, it's me. It be, um, I think that will be a good wall to be in, I think, probably for a talk. Yep. Bueno, se escucha bien, está todo bien. Yeah, I think that what that would be a nice wall to be for the panel. I'm just trying to find the turning around. I mean, this is a you have no idea the ability I have to go behind the walls. I don't know how do I manage to do that. Ah, uh, how do I turn around? Uh, yeah, more or less, right? This is as far as I can get. I do okay. My, my, my I, I, I love, I, I love your, uh, I love your logo, and I love your centerpiece there. By the way, it looks really great. Okay, well, that was uh, Keith had been working on that. You have no idea. He was crazy because it's the first time he does a, a, a three D sculpture in this space. So he had been learning this. He had been learning different softwares to get that. So wow. yeah, it looks really cool. Yeah. It's really cool. Yeah, it's convenient. Thank time. you. That's good. That's good. <laughs> I'm, ju I'm just going to check my, uh, my my WhatsApp. Yeah, check WhatsApp. Ch check what is going on with. Um... How did I yeah. get so tall today, Brendan? Oops. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, you're really tall. tall. You started. Yes. And then, and then you stood up after. Oh, there, there you go. No, I'm still sitting down. Uh, no. Oh, look, you press W. <laughs> If you press it before oh, the Oculus button, then that will bring you to eye level of paintings. Mm -hmm. But okay, if you want to cruise around up, up that 
Uh, which, which button you do that to get into the normal level? You press the up. Which button you need to press? Uh, yeah, the Oculus button. Um, you just yeah. press and hold that. And then that resets your height. Uh, okay. Okay. And yeah. If right, you want right. to stay in tall, say you're sitting in a chair um, and yeah. you're at eye level, and then you stay at that, then you'll be higher. But you need to be standing up, or, or it remembers? Uh, no, just uh, you need to stay at that. Or you could, I guess, sit on the floor and then set your avatar height and then sit in the chair, and then it will. Make you seem like no, no, no. I think I stay where I am. I am in a chair and I am cycling. My legs are moving in a, in a sitting chair, a bicycle in the meantime. So that's why. You're biking right now? <laughs> oh, yeah. It helps me to do some major exercise. It's too much sitting in the computer otherwise. <laughs> so, so, you know, this little, this little bicycle oh, you put you under the right? table? Yeah. You know? <laughs> so they are really cool. <laughs> My niece is biking around right now. <laughs> yeah. That's it. That's the only then, thing is uh, when I'm doing that, I keep pushing back from the table. <laughs> it keeps pushing back every time I'm moving, so I need to hold the table with the hands. <laughs> but it is good. And then um, we have Augustine. Um, he's doing a live stream across LinkedIn, YouTube, and a few different channels. So uh, okay. hello, LinkedIn, YouTube world. Hello. So you only can see my back, isn't it, Augustine? Oops. Right, so I don't know what I do. So, oops, oops. you came on top. <laughs> well, is, is, hey, hey. You're having fun, JW. I, I'm, I'm having fun, but I'm, I'm also a little bit uh, disappointed that, uh, that that John's obviously having some uh, some, some challenges. Bear, bear in mind, of course, it's like four o'clock in the morning. Uh, yeah. in, uh, oh, like, um, like it's four a.m. in uh, like he's in Byron Bay right now. So he have test. He, he have never come to the Argate before. He have no testing coming. Never, never, never. Oh, good because Lord. of the, uh, <laughs> he's, he's, he's got a he's got a gallery going on, and uh, he's um, uh, he he's the head of uh, post grad at uh, at university, and he really you know I could never I could never connect Brandon and uh, and him at a time that that, that worked. But uh, anyway, uh, that's going to change over the. Uh, the course of the, uh, the, the Biennale. Uh, I, I kind of refuse to get stressed anymore, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it. No, me too. Me too. You can only do your best and uh, trust that things will work out. So that's it. Yeah, for, 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 for sure. So, uh, because you know. otherwise it's crazy. Yeah. It, it is Arte, uh, Artemis. Hello, Artemis. Welcome. Hello, Hello Artemis. Hello. 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 Nice to see you. Hello. Yeah, nice to see you. Lovely, lovely to see nice you, Artemis. Okay, yeah. can we high five, Artemis? I'm, I'm, I'm on that. Uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> do, I, I'm going to do that. <laughs> do, do I need to? Do I need to press anything? Am I high five? No, that's it. No, that's it. That's it. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. That's so cool. That's so cool. That's it. Nice and simple. Yeah. Uh, wow. Um, what a what a what a great uh, 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 title that you've got for your uh, panel discussion uh my thing um let me know when you when, when you want to start I, I love it because uh you know the um well you know i mean to to exhibit art uh, to have exhibitions fairs biennales um you know the the, the 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 elephant in the room uh is the fact that uh, you know with, with, with air travel with transport with uh uh, um, you know all of the logistics and packaging and everything that goes into uh, to creating galleries uh, is, let's face it, um, you know something that so that has been a challenge and you know the industry uh, you know needs to be disrupted and uh, that's why it's so exciting to be in this space even though um, you know it's a space for uh, for someone like myself and. Uh, and, 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 and my sort of cohort uh, that you know, really, really, really just needs to uh, to be able to adopt to it. But this is, you know, this is the solution for uh, uh, for so yeah. much. What what you know, the, the art caravan, uh, as it's called, that uh, that has to, okay. uh, you know, fly. That has to, uh, you know, all of those uh, logistical and uh, uh, greenhouse. Uh, 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 gas emission um, situations, um, you know, 
I, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited to be here right now, and uh, um, yeah, great, uh, great title. But, uh, I'll let you, I'll let you open. Okay, well, you have already introduced the whole, uh, the title idea was for random, so I, and I thought, yeah, this is a good idea, so let's do that. Uh, so Keith is here, um, uh, Dr. Uh, John Dalston is not here, so I think that we have three or four of the panels, so I think that if you are okay, we can get started. Well, you had already started, it was a pretty good starting point. So, um, for no that you don't know me, I am Maite Baron, and uh, I am co-founder of Baron Gartner House, and I am a conceptual mixed media artist, concerned about the environment and uh, social issues. Um, J.W. Um, Miller, he is an, uh, an environmental art producer, and Keith Grafton is a conceptual uh, digital artist, uh, also talking about social issues uh, in the way that we live in, mostly in urban cities. So it's a mixture, as you will see, of uh, what attracts us to the different ways how we can tackle the climate uh, change emergency. So a brief introduction, uh, JW started, but basically uh, we have a responsibility, uh, all of us as participants of the art world and the art industry, because as any industry, we create a huge amount of uh, emissions. The main area that we do that is through transport by going to fairs. Then by 2019, we came around 300 art fairs a year, which means nearly an art fair per day, which is actually basically that created already at a time before the pandemic, uh, uh, a fair tick where people were thinking we had reached the tipping point is too many at first. So well, we see what is going to happen after the pandemic, if people had uh, learned from that or we go back to the old ways. I have no idea, but I, I wish to believe that it's going to be a huge reduction on that and use more technology like the metaverse in order to gather us, us all together. The second area where the art industry creates a lot of emissions is through uh, the, the waste in the landfill. Every time that there is an exhibition at the Biennale, it's a huge amount of waste that goes into the landfill with all the materials used. For example, you think about the Venice Biennale, tiny space Venice to, uh, to really store all the materials that they have used to create, them, uh, to create the, the, the pavilions. All that goes into waste in the greater percentage. And the third um, area where we do that is uh, and, um, the, bit of, uh, the building infrastructures. So the, the amount of heating, electricity and water that is consumed on physical galleries. So as by being here all together, we are really contributing to make this uh, emergency much better because we are not traveling, so we are cutting emissions on that. We are not using a physical uh, space, so we don't need to have landfill waste after the Meta Biennale. Everything will stay in place. So I think that well done, we are doing well already. What are the challenges for the metaverse and the environment? There are two main areas, which is all to do with electricity. One is the servers where the metaverse is being called, because it uses a huge amount of electricity. So this is a, a a conscious uh, environmental decision for people holding these kind of spaces to use for servers than they use green energy. And the second one is the NFTs. The NFTs, which is a new fashion now, I don't know if it's going to stay or not, but again, it's, right now, it's a huge consumption of energy. That's why at the moment we have not any NFTs. We are waiting to see where really the technology goes, and we are really hoping that those that believe that they are creating Green NFTs actually is not just told, but actually is real. So we are in a very exciting time. Uh, let's see how we all shape that world. It's our responsibility individually as well as collectively to shape the world that we are creating. So let's just start with you, JW. Uh, you are an art producer, an environmental art producer. So how these concerns uh, are part of your everyday life on the work that you do? Right, okay, um, great, and uh, well, well, look, um, the, 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 look, uh, <coughs> our, our, our industry, uh, by, by the way, I, I'm, I'm in multidiscipline arts and uh, everything from, uh, from, from music, film, uh, and, and also visual arts, uh, and, you know, if you just focus on um, contemporary art, you know, 
disruption is so needed uh, because um, you know it's just a, uh, a um, you, know, we're, 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 you know the whole logistical uh, and uh, environmental um, realities. Um, uh, you know, apart from the fact that uh, you know most uh, galleries were, 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 were you know have been sponsored by fossil fuel uh, companies in the in the past, which is you know we, we've got to be open and honest with ourselves in this world, and um, you know this kind of uh, a, a, you know a, a addiction and you know to, to travel to a, a gallery uh, and to bring our, our galleries to. Uh, uh, to different places around the world, um, you know, needs to needs to stop. Thankfully, uh, you know, platforms uh, and, and you know these these new uh, technical innovations such as uh, as our um, are allowing that to happen. Uh, and I really feel confident that even though I'm I'm really challenged and tested by the uh, by, by by these new technologies, I think that. Um, you know, we, each of us, uh, artists, gallerists, uh, producers, have a responsibility to, uh, to to make sure that we allow uh, this uh, new dawn to be uh, accessible, not just for artists, but for uh, uh, you know collectors, visitors, uh, and also um, those people that were perhaps um, unable to. Uh, you know, enjoy art. Um, I remember uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a child uh, having the opportunity to go to a gallery uh, with, with school, which was, again, a logistical nightmare for the school. So uh, there's so much that I can say about this, but what I'm, what, what I'm seeing is the possibility uh, and the reality, actually, uh, that is unfolding that allows uh, total uh, inclusivity uh, as well as you know new uh, collectors as well as traditional collectors uh, as long as we really just shout this from the rooftops and make sure that uh, um, you know we, we, we make this access and we allow um, this technology such as our APR to really um, allow just a simple transition into this new world which will uh, completely um, transform uh, the, as I said, the elephant in the room with regards to the art caravan which is all about travelling to, uh, you mentioned about the art fairs, one a, one a day, you know, it's, 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 not, uh, it's not sustainable but this um, has a, uh, look, I know that we'll be speaking in, in a few years' time, and I truly believe that 90% of art will be sold through uh, the, uh, the, the the metaverse. It's it's a it's a yeah. hunch, but I feel confident in that. Yeah, I do. I do believe what you are saying basically is that I hope that after the pandemic, because we are still a bit on that, so nothing is back to normal, and normal will never be normal as before. So we are creating. It's a great opportunity for a new beginning. And I do really hope that the metaverse, as the technology evolves and as we are able to uh, uh, embrace change and helping people to feel comfortable to come to these platforms, it will become, the art world will become a permanent hybrid model. I don't believe that it will be zero first because that's not possible, but I believe that people will understand that the first that you go are local. So if I am in London, I will go to Freeze London, but I am, I'm not going to go to Freeze uh, LA. I will just keep local. So uh, you still have an opportunity to connect with people, but instead of everybody traveling, maybe instead of the around all the fairs between Art Basel and, and Freeze, which are one of the more important ones, there is around 200 to 300 galleries, and it's around between 60 to 95,000 visitors a year. So if these 95,000 visitors don't travel, and only the 300 or the 200 calories travel is a huge reduction already. So we can do that, the hybrid model. So let me pass it to you, Keith. Uh, your work, um, Keith? Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay, because I'm not sure sometimes the, 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 the sound goes. Uh, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, you have no hands. Well, you have the a beautiful hands you have. So how does your work, a beautiful hands you have, 
So how does your work reflect all these um, opportunities? How do you uh, engage uh, the viewer of your works into think about the environmental impact that we all create? Okay, so. Uh, I become serious for work, because with the, uh, what they describe as social urban spaces. I'm, I'm looking at how people interact with spaces and urban spaces and everything else. Uh, I think you need to get to a, a world where urban spaces are much more greener, uh, much more quiet, uh, environmentally friendly. Uh, we need to do that. Uh, on that. And I'm interested in the way uh, the metaverse is going to affect uh, social interactions. It's quite, quite a, another aspect that I'm quite interested in. I mean, one of the things that I was aware of even before the pandemic started was that we live in a world where we're surrounded by people, but there's actually quite a lot of loneliness. And that people like the metaverse and uh, an environmental impact of the metaverse might actually be to reduce a lot of loneliness. Um, because it allows people either to go uh, with friends they already know, or already know, but to go to share an experience without physically traveling. Uh, and that, or we may need uh, to, to discover new people on that through the metaverse. You know, one of the beauties about the metaverse is that we have our avatars. Uh, Okay. I, I cannot just interrupt you one second because I think we are a little, a little lost. I think that because I know your work well, one of the things that you do well, I think, is that you represent on your work a lot of social issues. So in this case, this the isolation in the cities and the lack of uh, green spaces. And what you are inviting people to do, because your work is very futuristic, you paint a, a, a picture of the future of this, or in this case, of the future of the cities where we are closer to nature. So I will say that your work is quite a futuristic and visionary in to help us find a solution. I'm looking at where we're going. Yeah. Uh, Jacob, you, you are very interested about uh, the subjects of uh, microplastics and ocean-free uh, ocean plastics, basically, to clean up all the garbage from the, from the ocean. Can you tell us where that interest came from or where it, it is uh, initiative um, uh, came about? Sure. Um, thanks for uh, th thanks for asking. Um, and uh, so I've known um, Dr. John Dawson uh, for close to 15 years. And uh, mm -hmm. why um, art is so um, powerful is that, uh, you know, we are constantly um bombarded uh, that we are you know we're, we're not being good citizens in fact we're not even called citizens we're, we're, we're called consumers right um and you know we, we we all share this kind of um this shame uh with uh with, with how we are consuming and uh the, 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 the reality is uh, is that uh, you know we, we we kind of become either unconscious about it, uh, or we um, or we just take it all on ourselves, and that leads to so many you know mental health issues and and all of these things. So why art is so powerful is that it transcends because uh, it's the um, you know it's the synergy of aesthetics uh, and um, activism. Uh, that art so beautifully does, and I, I, you know, there, there's nothing else that does that so wonderfully and powerfully. Um, John's story is that uh, um, you know he um, was looking for driftwood on the beach close to uh, uh, over two decades ago, and uh, saw uh, the amount of detritus and plastic waste. Uh, on the shorelines of Byron uh, Bay, uh, and uh, you know, he started collecting them, but he didn't want them to be there, and realised there was such a uh, large amount of this. And he then transitioned from a sort of traditional contemporary artist uh, to um, you know his you know his his pioneering work as, a, as an environmental artist. Uh, and uh, around microplastics, um, people don't know the, the the realities, and I think it's it's, it's incumbent on us to uh, to share that message. And art is a great um, 
way to amplify that is a great transcender uh, because, um, you know, when you know the facts, when, once you know you can't unknow, the fact is, um, as we are speaking now on headsets or laptops, even though we're in the metaverse, we're breathing in microplastics. And um, to the equivalent of, of five grams uh, on average a week, actually children uh, consume more, babies more, because uh, you know, they're, 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 they've got all of those. Uh, you know, what I'm saying is, um, if we, um, uh, you know, if we, if, if we uh, are um, as artists, as gallerists, as lovers, as collectors of art, um, you know, um, are able to share that message, uh, then that's what creates change. Because um, if you know that right now uh, we are consuming the equivalent of a credit card's worth of microplastics, every single week. That's shocking. But um, art has a way to present that in a way that, that is not beating people on the heads or lowering self-esteem. It's a way that we all just become aware and wake up. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, um, it's quite interesting because uh, Keith looks about the impact in the environment in the cities. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, John Delson, and unfortunately, could not make it because, as what they say, he has challenges with the technology and it's four o'clock in, in Australia. And myself, I have both sides. I have this passion again for an ocean free plastics. And also for, uh, because I live in a city in London, uh, also for the, uh, the pollution and the amount of recycling and rubbish and waste that happens every day. I mean, every day that is the recycling day, it breaks my heart when I see the amount of crap that we collect every single week. And we just look at that, we pass by the street and we think this is normal. So I think that there is also, as you say, art has the power to connect to engage, to create change, and also to create a vision of the future, because we are the visual artists. So I think that it's a lot of politicians that they have a lot of smoke words. It's a lot of grandiose words, but at the end of the day, they don't really see what is really happening. So when you hear them, sometimes you're thinking, for God's sake, I mean, better to be quiet, because you can see that they are talking about something they don't really talk about, they don't really feel, they talk about because it's a fashion conversation. So, uh, if you walk in the streets of any city, that is a way of telling me the time because I can talk for hours. <laughs> Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> there it is. Uh, so, we, we have the power to do that. So, the question is yes, Artemis, please. Uh, and decide to, uh, you, you, yeah, you, you say to whom you want to ask the question. Yeah, no, no, please go ahead. Uh, okay. It's a conversation. Uh, I think this is a very vital moment to also point out um, the importance uh, of art and art activism. Uh, yes. So many artists, uh, they do not own, you know, some artists are just painters, but, uh, you know, and it's not only about the material culture they practice in their studios, but also how they convey their artistic practice to their everyday life. So, for example, a very famous um, artist like Mark Bradford, you know, this guy is a great activist because besides his artistic practice in the studio, he is, um, you know, a great gardener. He installed, um, you know, um, uh, in his local neighborhoods uh, with the black community, um, you know, in food deserts created these um, uh, green uh, islands in those food desert cities. I think, um, uh, I know Anna Gillespie, my uh, dear colleague and fellow artist friend, um, uh, she is uh, not only a studio artist, but she is an activist. With her artwork and with her body, um, she is going, uh, you know, to um, actively into protest movements. Um, JW, you just mentioned um, the issue about uh, you know, uh, oil companies who um, donate money money for museums. Yeah, she was there 
for example, to protest, protest about, about the connection between um, uh, how oil companies like BP are donating money into museums. And I think that is also a part of that movement uh, that not only our um, material culture taps into those issues, but also that we with our bodies can be a part of, um, you know, pushing enforcing those, you know, those issues um, through activism. Uh, that, I, I will say that I agree and I disagree. I think that to me is about, uh, I, I don't like, any, I don't like me generally, I don't like anybody to uh, frame me or label me or to tell me how I need to do things. So I think that activism suits certain personalities, but not everybody. And to me, I don't care how people choose to do it, as far as they get a personal commitment of doing it some way. For some people, yes, to take their own plastic bags, if you want to, to the supermarket, so they don't need to carry on buying more. It's a little action, but for this person, it's a way of contributing toward this movement of reducing uh, the waste. Uh, and it's as valid to me as the uh, somebody else's in the street. Like, for example, here we have the, uh, the Extinction Rebellion uh, activists uh, cutting the M25 for weeks that created a chaos to people that need, could not go to hospitals, uh, the, the supermarkets were empty because was not able to provide. I don't agree with that. I don't say it's right or wrong. I think that there are different ways. And what I would like to do with, with the work is to open up conversations. Some people ask, so what I am doing about, could I do something more or I could do it differently? Uh, yes, yes, Brendan. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Brendan. Yeah. I have a question uh, as well. Yeah. That's okay. Um, yeah. So, as as an environmental artist and, and with these considerations, um, the the context which you engage a wider public or a, a, a try to get a more global dialogue going on, um, how do you um, yourselves uh, wrestle with with that? Um, with respect to the, the structure of the, the current international art world um, and we have the, these, this new environment that's being made um, for international people to come together, share their ideas, share their art, but um, if this medium did exist, if this way of sharing did exist, how would you go about um, engaging an international community with your with your art and with your uh dialogue around environmentalism because it is a low it, it's kind of contradictory when i go into our basil and see an environmental piece and then know how much how much of a uh you know uh <laughs> How much disregard for environment, like the environment, just to get the artwork there, has to be done. So, how do you see those contradictions, and how do you yourselves navigate around that? Well, then, then you will use if that didn't exist, then what we were doing, we for years, uh, several years, we refused to travel to this uh, with kids. We refused to travel to these art fairs. We took the decision that that was not right, and as you say. You don't need to say what you say. You, you say you do what you are, what you say. So we decided not to travel to these fairs. So you connect people through social media. Uh, you you make connections and then you move these conversations through Zoom or Skype at a time, and that's fine. So there are ways if you really want to. Um, th there are ways. So. I, I, I think, okay, Brendan, it's a, it's a great point that, uh, that, that, that you raise, and I'm speaking on behalf of John, so John, if you listen to this recording, forgive me, because I know that uh, you'd love to, um, you know, you'd love to have your, your voice here, but I know that, uh, you know, artists um, are compelled uh, in, in ways that, uh, that, that they that they want their art to 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 really um, to really amplify, to really transcend, to you know, to to actually um, you know, to not be another uh, a sort of beating on the on the on the head. And I think that uh, you know, John's just released a, 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 a book, uh, Tideline, um, 
And I think it's really important to actually understand that uh, I think environmental artists like, like Mati, like, uh, like, like, uh, like, like Artemis, um, as, well as, as well as John, um, this is coming from, um, you know, this is coming from within. So I don't think any of them would have, uh, you know, you know, would have, would have, would have been contradictory in, uh, you know, in, in, in sort of, uh, 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 you know, going on that sort of art caravan sort of thing. Um, it, it, it's about having something that's so personal, you know, in ways that, uh, um, that, that are effectively um, amplifying a message without beating people on the head uh, that's more effective than actually beating people on the head because the more um, we as citizens, not consumers, I hate that term, um, are awake and, um, you know, and aware of the realities, then that's what's going to cause the, uh, the, 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 the change. So that's why, I guess, you know, uh, my take, uh, uh, Keith, Artemis, and, and all, of, you know, and all uh, are, are actually here right now um, in this new space because it, it means so much. Yeah. I guess it's like a, a, path, a path forward. Absolutely, it's a path forward. Uh, tiger, the tiger butterfly, you wanted to ask a question before you raise your hand? <laughs> or you change your mind? That you are reading my mind because I'm wondering, and sorry I had some trouble issue, technical issue at the beginning of the talk, so maybe I missed it. Uh, part of Could you it. also do uh, a quick introduction of who you are, just so everyone has context? Uh, and, and come closer. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm uh, the Tiger of the Fly. Um, I'm the co content marketing director uh, of the website about VR experiences related to travel and art. <laughs> and. Yep. Um, I'm very interested in uh, the metaverse and uh, about the uh, art GDR and the artist here. And um, I am wondering um, regarding the environment if uh, a VR headset, you know, uh, we are uh, using a lot of plastic and a lot of material to, to create it. And uh, I'm wondering if it's so if it's uh, so ecological, uh, such a ecolo ecological, sorry, <laughs> sorry for my French. <laughs> Excuse my um, French. Uh, solution, you know, um, I don't know what, uh, what you are thinking uh, about, uh, about this. Okay, what, what I will say is that I'm, I'm, I'm joining through the computer. Yeah, joining through the computer is the equivalent of using a light bulb in your home. So that is pretty ecological. Uh, how much a headset consumes, I have no idea. That I don't know, but certainly it consumes less than flying, that's for sure. Uh, the, the headsets, the plus, uh, there are, they should be, I mean, I assume that they are created to last. So we are not going to eliminate plastic forever. What we need to be looking at is how to create things that they last for a long time as they used to be before. Before, you would buy a fridge that will last 20 years. Now they are done to last three years and they are technically obsolete. Make sure that you need to buy another one. So we cannot say we are never going to produce plastic. Plastic is a fantastic material for certain things that will not be possible with a different material. And it's, it lasts very long. It's the positive and the negative. The negative is that empty bottle of milk can last 100 years floating in the water, in the ocean. That's the negative. The positive is that if we create consciously products with plastic or other materials that last 10, 20, 30 years, then that's okay. Because we need to have some things to, we need to have the headset make or something. So if we were doing of aluminium, it would be more damaging still uh, than if it was a half plastic, than it probably could be done with recycling plastic. So again, it will be a circular economy that uses materials for a different purpose. And I think this is part of the conversation, how we can bring the waste more into the circular economy so that they don't go to the landfill and just become something else. Yeah. Great, 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 Mati. I don't know where, where, where Tiger's gone. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, um, 
you know, how we are now uh, joining um, in the metaverse, on, uh, on laptops, uh, on live streams, uh, and, uh, and more. Okay, the, the um, you know, what, what we were doing before um, to actually uh, enjoy, to collect, to experience, uh, to, um, to, 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 to dress. Oh, sorry. Jonathan's made it. Ah, Dr. John is here. Okay. What? <coughs> I just, just wanted to, to, to say to, uh, to, to Tiger, this... Okay. Um, hi, hi again. I'm sorry. I've got uh, a technical issue. I'm really sorry. It's okay. Don't sorry. worry. I, I'm not Don't sure. Don't worry. Are, can you you are in and yeah, out. I, I can see that. To address your, your, your question. Um, you know, the... Um, you know, the, the, as I said, that, that whole art caravan, which is about you know, tra you know creating your, your galleries uh, in different uh, uh, museums and, uh, uh, and exhibitions around the world at fairs, uh, and um, you know, you know that is so unsustainable. And uh, thank goodness this is disrupting that. Now, um, for sure, you're right. This is plastic, but it's it's not a single use plastic. If you package your artwork. Uh, and you stick it on a plane uh, to uh, to go to a gallery in, in New York or, or LA or uh, London or, or wherever in the uh, in the world. Um, all of all, all of that, um, you know, all of those emissions, all of that carbon footprint that's left. Uh, you know, what we're doing now it pales into uh, it, 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 it pales into you know, insignificance. I'm not saying that we, we, we could do better, but what I'm saying, we've got all of these people here now, haven't had to fly, they haven't had to, uh, all the artists haven't had to uh, 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 you know, transport their artwork, package their artwork, um, use lighting, use uh, all of that. So we're, we're talking about uh, reducing something from uh, 100% to Five percent right now. That's all. Mm. People from uh, yeah. Australia, mm. Australia, uh, Artem Artemis, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, how do you, uh, just so we have to talk about what you say because right now we are in this what you earlier indicated in this global guilt we are sharing about the CO2 uh, footprint we are leaving. Um, and um, I just wanted to add that um, we, having this discussion right now really creates this awareness of soaring um, guilt about the CO2 footprint we create anyway. So it's just a matter how to reduce it. And, um, you know, meeting in a space like that actually reduces the CO2 print. We don't need it. We, you know, we, we still create some, but it's way lower. And I think uh, creating those, convers having those conversations, you know, arises the awareness how to be more mindful with our resources. And when um, we accept that also the fact that we are in a tr transformative time, I envision that we are not sitting here with uh, these big Oculus goggles. Um, probably in the near future, we are just wearing regular, um, um, you know, glasses. Um, I was in a, in, a, in a store yesterday where they sell, you know, glasses from Ray Ban, for example, and they already have the, these little cameras incorporated and uh, at some point we are going to look at holograms so um, for me this is just a baby shoe i'm having on my head <laughs> no, it's, it's the beginning uh, I, mean, it, I mean i don't know if we realize sometimes that we are at the beginning of something that didn't exist so we, we are shaping it so it's the little things that are a little imperfect clumsy or whatever you want to call it and when we look at it, uh, hello, uh, come here, hello, John, hello, John, please join us. We would love to hear from you. Hello, hello, John. Comfortable with the controls. Okay, so okay, that's get, fine. Let's get him here, then we'll all kind of organize uh, around. Uh, okay, I think, okay. Hello, John, can you hear us? Yes, hello, everybody. Look, I can help the mouse in the position team now. I can see everybody. Um, okay, perfect. 
really massively expand in space. And I think it's um, a fantastic that it's being addressed in this space. And that I also have the capacity to be able to show an enormous amount of work through this area. So hopefully it will get to have the pressure upon people. But I, I do notice that um, in general, that there's a, a, there's a, um, a greater awareness these days uh, than there was in the initial time when I first started exhibiting this work. And I, I first started making the work around 1996 or so. And then I started really exhibiting it in 1999. It took me a few, 1998, it took me a few years developing the work and creating the, I guess, the, um, uh, the supply of materials to work from to just keep on collecting and collecting and collecting until I had enough materials to be able to actually create these objects. Now, over the years, I, I did find that what, what happened was that a lot more people became aware of it because more practitioners started working in the field, but the more that they, other people saw it, but the more they also started exhibiting it. And here in Australia, it's become quite a popular art form. We have this work in different objects in either sculptural areas or wall work areas or installations or whatever. It, it, it has really become a very popular, um, I guess, method of art making uh, by now. And there's much more of an awareness of the public um, about this type of work and about the impact that people are having on the environment. That said, it's also like a bit of a, a double-edged sword there because there's so many people are beginning to work with it that this standard of exhibitions that you're seeing that this type of, type of work with really varies between um, very, very fine art and incredible um, the, the, the quality is really museum standard or world standard, all the way down to very, very poor, uh, blunt statements about the environment that have been passed off as, um, as uh, art, which is unfortunate because then uh, it tends to be a bit of a murky water there, what people are being um, exposed to when they look at these type of exhibitions. Um, and the, 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 the definition of quality really varies from very small or uh, 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 very uh, dubious um, quality all the way up to the world standard and the Australian quality standard. So, you know, the, all of this sort of interaction and, and, and play has been happening over the period of this 25 years that I've seen. Um, I, I, I'll leave it there so that the panel also ask any other questions or I can just shift it a little bit further, but I hope that that brings a little bit of um, uh, insight into the question that you asked me then, Roger. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, there is another question I was born in me. I see your work and your work is absolutely beautiful. And that won't make me wonder that if you if we pre if you present uh, environmental art uh, in your case with uh, microplastics that you find in the coast in Australia that they are so beautiful, are we somehow making beautiful works with things that they are discarded, romanticizing uh, that these things exist and they are left because somebody will collect them and do something beautiful about it in a way? This is a real, this is a really good question, a very incisive question. Um, nobody's ever actually asked me this question before, and I'm happy for it. Um, now, when you say that, I know that, that myself, as an artist, I've been challenged by, you mentioned before, the fact that you're also an urban artist, so presumably you're working with um, materials that you gather or collect from, um, from the urban areas, and I was thinking the moment you said that, I thought, uh, that that will present its own challenges, um, to set, but because of the materials, um, different, very different from the challenges that aren't faced as an environmental artist these days. Maybe working with microplastics, very small, uh, tiny little pieces of plastics. I don't so much work with larger uh, plastics these days, because largely the general public are picking up these larger plastics as well. So, um, but they're missing. The smaller pieces of lump on them, and I'm able to make these uh, quite interesting works on Belgian linen with these microplastics that I wasn't uh, entering into in the early days. 
Now, <clears throat> my intention as a visual artist was Chaplin's rat from the start when I first started collecting this plastics, and that is how to make something of things that would also work in terms of my sense of aesthetics and beauty, as well as working with challenging objects such as what people saw as being trash or rubbish or beach litter or whatever it can be called. Most of the, most of the comments were uh, judgmental in terms of, uh, what I say, uh, trash or rubbish or, let's say, something ugly. You know, that's a, that's a judgment call in its own right. Now, who's to say it's ugly? And who's to judge the colour pink? Who's to judge the colour brown? For example, and I found during that whole path of journey of assembling all of these objects and putting putting them together, I I guess I pretty much um, uh, lent upon the fact that I'd been trained as a painter uh, for many years and then um, worked as a painter. And I'm talking about painting pictures. I'm seeing on the wall behind me, uh, behind you in this uh, panel. Um, and for many years, my concerns were about composition, about line, about color, and about form, and things like this. Just really the classical uh, things that we concern ourselves as artists when we when we are making a picture. But all of these qualities, I also um, <clears throat> I, I get uh, relied upon in the creation of each of these artworks, right from the first person, the first artwork that I made, which was in Marte. 98 and it was called uh, um, God Coast. It's a four panel piece and I believe, and I've got it in my exhibition, but Gene uh, uh, has been uh, putting putting together uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's currently in the show there at the moment. Uh, uh, full, full, full disclosure, John, John just, to, uh, yeah. just, just, to, just to interrupt. Um, yeah. your, your, your gallery is certainly under construction as the challenges um, uh, of actually making it look amazing. Uh, I just want to just want to say to you that uh, I really, you know, um, I know that you were probably one of the first artists to uh, to have a website back in I don't know ninety eight or something, right? Like, uh, and and I think it's really brave, bold, and uh, and, and brilliant that uh, that you're uh, that, you know that that, that we that we're um, and I'm saying this with respect to, to everybody, but, but for you who's had a, such a long career, to say, okay, well, let, let's go into the, uh, the, the, the metaverse. So um, I, I, we'll, we'll, let's hold back on, on directing people to your uh, galleries right now because that would just <laughs> put in stuff together. <laughs> And that's right. I went through the first few rooms and it, it was looking really good. Um, there, there's a couple more rooms I can still see are in progress, but the, for, the first couple look, look nice. Uh, you are getting there. Yes, you are getting absolutely. there. Yeah, that, that's really fantastic. Thank you, Tim. Yeah, very incredibly respectful. I love it. Thank you. Thanks, man. Lovely to It's JW, by the way. Uh, just, uh, you know, yeah, that's the Okay, so. Um, all right, so back to that question. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a really, really good question, this one. Um, um, and I say that because uh, it's also a question that I haven't really been asked before, but I, I, I know the answer to it, or at least some of the answers uh, to that question about the use of these materials and about how that goes. Um, and, you know, whether, whether it is kind of... Um, romanticizing, I suppose, uh, the use of these plastics. For me, I, I didn't see that I had a choice for me uh, for it to be accessible to the general public. I needed to rely on a almost instinctual um, act, and that was to rely upon, um, uh, the, I, I guess, my um, facility and my knowledge as a visual artist um, uh, into this whole area of working with found plastics as best as I could. So it ended up being a mixture of it. And I'm kind of proud of this in a way that I've developed this kind of almost like a razor, razor's edge where I was walking along with the work and that kept it edging and it kept it kind of people really interested in it. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go 
explains what you said a little bit, um, because on the one hand, it's a, on, I, I found that I existed on this rise sense between um, uh, beauty and also or the attention to create something of beauty out of the material that is uh, not necessarily accepted as within the sphere of the art world, so, so to speak. And, and that has been a really interesting path uh, because on the one hand, what I find with the works is uh, when they're in the Gower situation, and this is something that I do experience a lot of, a lot of people actually walk into the Gower situation for display of art, is that they get kind of, there's a hook there with the work, and it might be that there's a beauty hook, and people walk in and they get really attracted by the beauty of the lips, and they, they really go into it, and then they go up close to it, and then they get almost a bit of a slap where they realize what it's actually made from. They realize, um, I guess, the integrity of these works are that they're made from all of these different minute bits and bits and pieces of plastic that are mostly recognizable as well, maybe with the top of the bottle or the top of the pen or an old, an old pair of glasses or something like this. And and then that slap is like, oh my God, I just came from the beach. It's how shocking is that? So on, in the one, mm -hmm. one way, they got, they got hooked in uh, by the beauty, and then they got slapped by the statement about the environment. Or the other way around, they got hooked in by the statement of the environment. And then they, the closer they got to the work, then they appreciate the beauty. But it was always on this on this razor's edge. And that, for me, I found the example as a visual artist, and it's pretty much driven my whole approach there, and it may be slightly romantic. I, I'm not too sure. To me, I, I, I see it more, more as a necessity. Um, yeah, so, so I'm, I'm able to leave you. John, I just want to, uh, John, that, that's brilliantly, brilliantly said. I just want to uh, um, you know, recognise uh, that this uh, event is, uh, is, is mighty. So I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to you sort of checking out some of her work as well. And, uh, um, no, 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 no. Let me clarify that this event is not about me. This event is about is is, is a is a panel discussion. It's a conversation about the impact on the environment. Later on, it will be about that. Later on, we are having the exhibition here about the opening of uh, the future is green. So talking about these works is going to be today at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern or 5 p.m. Uh, 8 o'clock London, 9 o'clock Europe. But right now, it's not about our work. Right now, it's about having the panel discussion, uh, getting uh, getting you all involved. So uh, Art Artemis is dying for asking a question, so please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, because I think it's a, it's a really interesting point uh, you are touching, John, and uh, thank you for you know um, uh, talking about this connection between the material, the material culture, and the aesthetics. and. Um, Something came into my mind uh, that uh, I was reading an interview with uh, Anselm Kiefer yesterday, and he talks about the aesthetics or his fascination about ruins. And um, for him, ruins are such an important matter because everything is in gravel and in, uh, and, you know, uh, dis in destruction. And uh, looking at ruins is for him perspective of aesthetics because he understands it as a beginning point, as a time of transformation. Um, how do you relate uh, within that context of what you said about the aesthetics, um, the material you use? Is that a question to me again? Yes. <laughs> Could you um, as in there? to that fascination of particular, uh, being fascinated, you know, about ruins because I, I see this connection but I'm not sure if you you would see it in your with your work. Uh, look, look at, absolutely in, in some ways yes uh, again again uh, you just click down the car and just one second. Well, he's not here. I'm going to comment something because I found interesting what uh, John was saying. 
the aesthetical beauty, uh, John also has a background in philosophy, which I think it comes very much across on his values and the intention of his work, uh, which I feel very connected very much with that as well. For me, on the, uh, on the materials that I use, uh, that I found in the street or I found in the beach, is important the aspect of connection with the history of uh, where this piece come from and to who it belongs. So um, I think that um, every single piece, <laughs> John is there. <laughs> it's here on that. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just going to very quietly slide. I hope that thank you so much for hosting us. This was really interesting. Welcome back. See you later on, hopefully. But I know. Are, are you here, uh, John? Or Yes, yes, I'm here. Yeah, I'm okay. That's... No. Don't worry. The technology takes a bit to get used to it. It's normal. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this is, uh, I'm, I'm trying to get next to you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm moving. Oh, that's okay. I'll stay, I'll stay, 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 stay. Um, look, if, if, you, if you'd like, I could talk a little bit about that whole, um, the concept of the ruins and things like this, and that's how Keith's work, I've always, I've loved, always loved um, his work, and um, and I can see that, that connection that he's making in, in, in talking about these sort of things. Um, it, it, you know, absolutely the history of all of these different plastics has been something that has fascinated me since the, since the first time I started collecting uh, this work. And, and, but it has its own individual history and unique history. But, um, it's not so much about the ruins of, um, I, I, I guess, buildings and things like that, but it's, it's about the in some ways, the ruins of contemporary society in the best plastics um, from that early age. Uh, from, you know, I think uh, the last 50, 70 years or so, these plastics have been washing around the planet. Um, and uh, only more noticeably, about, probably about 20 years ago, or 25, 30 years ago, um, that they started being collected on beaches. So when I started collecting these uh, objects, I started to um, look into the history of these uh, these pieces and it had its own unique sort of quality that I related to and that developed, um, I guess for me, it developed um, the whole concept about what I was doing. And, and um, before I knew it, people from the ABC here in Australia were sending me articles or, or, and notes and things like that about what had been discovered with plastics and things like this. And, and so I started formulating quite a bit of information about the history of plastics and plastic uh, reuse and plastic uh, and discarding in, in, the, in Australia and globally and things like that. And I started being introduced to companies like Clean Up Australia and Clean Up the World and developing associations with them who had been really busy using plastics and things like that. And, um, <coughs> I have I think, somehow or other in the work always managed to keep a very, I suppose, fairly contemporary and, um, and focused um, uh, statement about the use of these plastics. And I've, I've mainly been making semi abstract landscapes and things like that with them, in some, in some cases, more figurative things and sometimes completely abstract uh, works with them, but um, as a way of. Uh, Describing, um, I don't know, describing a context uh, within how these plastics are used. So, um, and I think that that um, uh, hopefully, hopefully that, that comment is helping to describe a little bit um, my my history, or uh, when it comes to um, how I view the history of the plastics and how I express uh, the use of these plastics in my artworks. I, I, I uh, John, and this is a question for both, for John and for Keith as well. Um, when I find an object, because I don't know how that happened, but every day when I'm walking in the street, every day I find an object. So it's like the object is looking for me to be found. Because I always say to Keith, I can't believe the amount of people that have just passed by and nobody has seen that. So it looks like it's waiting for me to walk and find it. So I am very fascinated about, I believe that everything is, I don't believe, uh, I believe everything has a purpose. So when I found an object, like for example, on the artworks in the, in the background, I found bicycle chains in the, in, the, in the floor. And I thought, 
wow, how many rides will this chain have been made? Uh, who was the cyclist that lost or changed the chain and didn't care to collect it and just leave it in the ground? Is that a consideration important for you when you found something? Do you believe that the objects that you find have energy and that this energy guides you about what to do with them? Uh, right. right. Uh, um, yeah, I can. I'm happy to start with that. Okay. Um, yes, look, I, I think this is... Um, it is wonderful that you're also having a similar experience <laughs> that I also have in that, uh, because um, that very much is the case. And some objects more than others, of course, um, but each one does have its energy and each one does have its history, uh, whether it be an old pair of glasses that you find on the beach or whether it be um, somebody's um, um, plastic uh, teeth, which I also found, for example, and this is a more obvious case. Um, where I found a, a broken pair of dentures shoes um, right up in the corner of one beach, and I was fascinated by that. And then about another kilometre further on the beach, I found the other half of these dentures, which was very, very strange and odd. And they ended up in, in a prime position in, in one of my artworks. <laughs> and so I know exactly what you're talking about there. I know these are really interesting concept because every object has its own sense of history, particularly plastics, I find. Because you know, they've been used and they're a familiar thing. This is also why I, I enjoy working with them. And this is why I also um, the challenge to work with microplastics where it's less obvious what these what the history of these plastics are um, is even more acute, I find these days. However, they themselves also have their own history. They've been somewhere or other they've broken down into very small microplastic, but each of them has their own history, but just less obvious than what we were talking about. That. I can completely relate to what you're saying, yes. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Keith? You're always with your camera. Um, so, what is in your mind when you just decide to click to something that you just see, something that it looks ordinary and banal? I, I see, see a lot of things. That, I mean, some quite often, like us, maybe don't want to and you look at an object, uh, and it might be just a, uh, a crushed plastic uh, uh, cup or, or something else. And it's like, first of all, sometimes it's the light just catches it. You, you only have a moment to catch it. Because, like, as you say, it's just like, where did this actually come from? What's its history? Uh, does it have a sort of energy about it? Um, uh, and it's quite, quite sometimes fascinating. To imagine there's a story, there's a story there, and you build up on, on, on that very thing, and the picture, and the take it, captures the story. Mm. Uh, quite fascinating. Mm -hmm. I think what is quite interesting is because uh, John and myself were uh, mixed media somehow and we are physical working. Your starting point is always photography. So in some ways that you are taking a reference of a moment in history, when you make the clip in your camera, you are just frozen in a time, a moment of time. And then it's you... It's not just the object or the location of it. It's also like just at this moment, the, sun, the light shines on it, casts a shadow, or produces a, a, a reflection or something else, and the whole thing is just like it's instance in time. And you come back a minute later, everything's changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, to bring it back to you, Marky, I mean, you find this like, for example, you find quite a lot. Uh, when we go out, you find quite a lot of things in, in the streets. Uh, you can put out uh, uh, some pieces you found. Uh, I mean, uh, what piece of art? What piece of uh, is, is you found? Uh, so, some, some dolls on that. Um, I wonder the history of that is. Yeah, to me, the history, yeah, to me, the history, not on the traditional sense of history, but uh, who, uh, who had bought this, this uh, who, who, to whom it belonged, and um, how he managed to go into the floor, and why this person put it on my pathway so that I can find it for them. So it's a, it's a way of passing something like a gift and somebody i always see when I, whatever i found in the street or in the beach like a gift that somebody's giving me and uh, they are giving it for me to give them a new life 
uh, a new interpretation and that I think is, is fascinating to me um, because I mean when I found some dolls I, I go home and I clean them I comb the hair I, I, get, I make them clean I disinfect everything I find always I put it everything in the dishwasher um, but I'm thinking, okay, so now you're here, now you're part of the family, so what do you want me to do with you? My work is very autobiographical, unconscious, unconscious autobiographical, and it's also very a process of automatism. I never know what I'm going to do. I start with a feeling, but when I am working with found objects, I ask the object, what, as a communication, says, what do you want me? What do you want me to put across? What is the message that needs to go into the world? And how do you want me to work with you? Do you want to use acrylics? Do you want I was canvas or I work in a book panel or do you want me to be a sculptor? Tell me what you want from me. So I become a messenger uh, of that object um, to put it across into the world and then the viewer will make their own interpretation. I don't like to be prescriptive. I like people to uh, to see it as a conversation so the artwork talks to them and every person sees or hears or feels whatever they need in that moment of time. I agree with you, uh, John, the importance of creating something beautiful. For me, beauty, I cannot live in a place that is not beautiful. Beauty is, is, is as important for me as the air I breathe. I, I, need a, I need something that is holistic and harmonious. I cannot live in a mess. Uh, even though my studio is so full of recycling that sometimes it's a little messy. Um, but every kid says, I don't want to take that home. I say, yeah, I want to do this to the studio. It's full. He says, no, it's a space for that. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's so wonderful to hear because you, you, you know, um, I, 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 you know, mess with, uh, with, with, with John's work because he always refers to it as, as my plastics, and uh, mm. you know, that, uh, that, 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 that obviously has a, a synergy, and uh, um, you know, in the same way that you regard everything that, everything that you find, it becomes part of the family. That's how I see it. Right. <laughs> Are you here, John? Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> okay. so I'm here. Okay, I'm not sure sometimes <laughs> if you go. Yeah. I'm taking all of this in. I just found it, you know, it's really, um, it's, it's lovely to hear somebody else talking about the, uh, this approach to art making because I also have a very similar approach to that when I'm in the studio and I'm constantly asking the word, what is it? Uh, where do you want to go? what is the direction and I like to get out of the way as much as I can in that art making process so I'm really being directed by forces beyond myself and this is something else and the materials often uh, will tell you where they want to go and then eventually the artwork itself will tell you where it wants to go what needs to happen what needs to and it's not really necessarily um, but they're based upon um, more of an I would just say more of a um, left side of the brain approach. You're mm. more of making art from the right side of the brain where it's intuitive and you're trusting mm. in your abilities as an art maker uh, to make these right, bang, right decisions about composition and line and, and colour and things and form and things like this. Um, and then the materials are adding into that which help, uh, help to be, um, become what it's going to become. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm remembering uh, an exhibition that I was co-curating over in New York. It was, uh, it was around 20 years ago. I think it was in, uh, in 2003 or something like that. And, yeah. Anyway, and, um, and I had I was doing it with another uh, professor over there at the University of New York, and um, we each had 12 artists that we were uh, curating. And one of the artists that, um, that the other person had <coughs> uh, was was uh, curating. I wanted to exhibit a, a bunch of garbage bags just full of rubbish on the floor of the gallery. And this was um, it was a really excellent uh, exhibition. It was it was an amazing exhibition, incredibly high step of works from around the globe. Um, and and this person really just wanted to have a make a statement. And I, 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 the other curator asked me about the exhibition of the things. And I said, you know, this is entirely your decision because it's, it's part of the 
your exhibition, your delivery, or what your book you're graduating. So you, you need to make the final choice. But I said, but I personally find it very powerful. The work itself was very blunt. It kind of smelled a little bit. Um, I didn't find that there was too much of a process of, um, I guess, where that person had um, <coughs> done the necessary work as an artist to take a transform it from being a very base uh, object into something um, that had some, uh, some um, I, I, I guess, value, um, and the aesthetic value didn't have much at all, and a certain amount of aesthetic value, but overall I found it a very blunt state. Um, that I, I just found it a bit lazy. Um, so in that sense, um, yeah, I mean, there, there are so many different ways to, uh, I don't know, to, to have to make these decisions, and, and my decision making would have been very different from that particular artist. We ended up including the artists in the exhibition, and it ended up being okay. But, but I, I, that was my point. I really was faced with that dilemma of okay, you know, how how uh, um, how does that work find inclusion in, um, in another uh, series of works on the exhibition that are all of a really really high standard. And here we have something that is um, and that's essentially um, exception from people who visit the gallery space where it smelt and it didn't really look at all about engaging and, and it didn't really look like the artists had gone through a process to really take that, that transform and, and do the necessary uh, work as a visual artist to, um, yeah, to, to make it into something that um, had all of the qualities of being a fine art piece. Uh, and my, I'm a little bit off topic here, but I, I, I just think that somewhere or other it's related. It was an interesting thing that we were faced with back then many years ago. Uh, I think my say that, that you, you know you have that uh, you have that connection with with everything that said it, but you find. Um, you know, in the same way that uh, that John does, and I think that that um, that, that, that reflects in, uh, in, in in your art. Um, so it's uh, it's great to hear both uh, both you and uh, and John sort of um, you know amplifying and uh, uh, that, that, that that same sort of that, that, you know, that, that same uh, connection with um, you know those, those objects that uh, that you go on to to create uh, with. To me, everything is connected in the world. Um, everybody and everything is connected. That's why I find difficult to understand how sometimes we can be harsh to one another, or how we can we have this disrespect for nature. Because to me, throwing away rubbish into the beach or into the field is a lack of respect, which I rather to describe as, as ignorance more than somebody that does something like that intentionally. Uh, I like to, to believe on the positive side of people and as well in all the artworks I do, I don't try to point the finger about what people are doing right or wrong. I just want to inspire people to reflect on what it is that they are doing and question themselves when they are ready if they could do something different or better. Um, but I think that always like to get people uplifted so that they can have mental space to contemplate the world. Um, with different eyes, hopefully. But the fact that the belief that everything is connected, I think that makes a big difference because when we are disconnected, like nature has nothing to do with me. The rubbish I put in the street has nothing, nothing to do with me. Uh, people born in the forest has nothing to do with me. That is when we arrive to the world where, where we are living today, where basically we are destroying the more beautiful resources, which is Earth. And the, the oceans, obviously, everything that we have here, we take it for granted. And I think that is a historical moment where we are realized that we are in a tipping point, and these are resources that we have been wasting. We realize how everything is so precious, everything. Even just walking in the street, holding hands is precious, and the piece of um, 
microplastic than you had found in the in, in, in the beach near you is precious because it had given a function to somebody, it had belonged to somebody. What was missing maybe in general is the intention of what we are creating, what we are creating, and do we need to create it at all? Because if we recycle more, but also if we reuse more, we need to create less. Um, so it's also a political, social political concern, which there are a lot of uh, hidden interests behind everything. And until we raise the level of consciousness, uh, individually, collectively, and socially, I think that we are having a dilemma that is just going to move very like baby steps forward. And we need to be able to move more agile towards the future in order to solve this problem. But at the same time, I am positive that every step forward is a step forward and it's better than no step at all. Um, Sure, and, and absolutely, and, and back to your, uh, your, you know, your, your title for this uh, for this panel, uh, Mike. Um, you know what what uh, what an amazing time we're we're, we're, we're in, uh, and uh, you know the, the art world um, has always um, you know been um, you know <laughs> exhibiting art has always been a a challenge for uh, for, for the environment because um, you know. To, to get uh, you know the, the, the logistics. So um, mm. where we are right now uh, is a um, you know a, a new dawn that um, you know, can perhaps really eliminate uh, all of all of that uh, uh, um, you know all of those um, environmental concerns as long as of course the technology is accessible. Um, you know, to uh, you, you know, it is is more and more accessible in a way uh, that, uh, that that it, that's inclusive to traditional art buyers, collectors, and also you know, new. Um, so uh, you know, that's why um, it's uh, it, it, it's an exciting time. I think it's an exciting time, and as what they say, technology will evolve, but we cannot forget that technology also brings some environmental issues that they need to be solved. Because I'm hearing this NFT conversation and everybody's very excited about that, very good. Everybody's trying to make as much money as possible. But again, technology, the same as science, are very powerful, but only if they are used for good. They are, they are very powerful for good or for bad. So the ethics on the decisions that we take cannot be left outside. And with the NFTs, everybody's more concerned about make, making money quicky, quicker, quicker. Uh, instead of how this new idea is creating a new environmental problem. And at the moment, until we get solved, how do, how do we, we can create NFTs uh, in a way that is ecological? To me, this is an issue. We are solving one and we are creating a new one. We are great about that. I mean, the, 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 the space is already full of space garbage left behind by every single astronaut going to the moon by every single uh, asteroid that we send, everything that we send from planet Earth, we have the power to create this rubbish behind. So the space has already uh, pollution, it's uh, metal pollution left behind by everything we are doing. So unfortunately, we seem to have this ability to disconnect things. And everything that we do is connected, but we don't see it. Um, so the NFTs is an issue that it really concerns me. I would like to see really real progress on that. And the cloud space in order to hold the metaverse is also an issue that it needs to be taken into account because the metaverse is going to become bigger and bigger and bigger and more powerful like it became with uh, what happened with the internet. It's the new internet, if you want to call it. So we need to find uh, uh, green energy to be able to power these servers Otherwise, we are creating a new problem. So maybe that is the next collection about <laughs> the challenges of technology, uh, which actually keeps your work is very much about uh, technology as well. You have this angle about technology and the impact on lifestyles and uh, everyday life, isn't it? Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, mean, uh, I like to bring um, the technology to see how it's impacted us. Uh, so I think, uh, Technology uh, plays a big part in nowadays in our social interactions for good and for 
not so good. So uh, I like to I like to see the technology angle. Of things. And another aspect, as you say, of the transportation is sending the artwork when somebody buys the artwork and it's, it's shipped all around the world. The amount of bubble wrap that the uh, art industry uses is beyond belief. So again, yes, people are doing now uh, degradable bubble wrap, but sorry, this is, a, this is not a solution to me. The solution is how we can create crates that can be reusable eternally without need of bubble wrap at all, so that they are fit and designed for purpose. I mean, I, I am a, a designer by background, a fashion designer, and I never understand how something that is properly designed has not uh, an expiry date. So if we create crates with recyclable, recycle, uh, recyclable materials, then they are great for purpose, then they can take at least 1,500 shipping uh, all around the world. That is real progress to me. Yes, to say, oh, well, well, we are going to get new bubble wrap, so it's more ecological. No, you are still creating bubble wrap, and it's still a problem, even that is less than before. So let's create long-lasting solutions, not just trying to create the past a little improved, so it looks better and it sounds better. Now, every packaging, I don't know where you live, but here you receive, your, I don't know, you ask a pair of socks, and you get so much packaging just telling you how much eco-friendly is this packaging. And I said, why do you need to put this eco-friendly bag and this eco-friendly uh, leaflet and this eco-friendly, all this crap? Honestly, I just, bought, I just want a pair of socks. I don't need all this packaging. So if, don't tell me on this nonsense. So you are polluting with no need. So how we can raise consciousness and inspire people, that is the on ongoing question. And how many yeah, different so ways so can we do it? And so with technology, you know, you, could, you mentioned NFTs. Um, it's uh, it, it's a it's a new medium to consume art uh, that can eliminate so many of the uh, uh, unsustainable um, parts of art in a way that allows um, you know authenticity, provenance, and uh, and all of those things. And and I know um, that that uh, you know, there, there's been. The proof of, uh, of work has been, you know, totally um, un, uh, unsustainable. And uh, um, yeah. but thankfully, uh, there are uh, there are new, you know, options, and there's you know green uh, ways to, uh, to to mint. And I think that uh, I think I think really uh, it should be, uh, you know, if you're if you're um, when you're selling your, your, your work as an NFT, it should be minted on demand in a way that uh, um, you know, utilizes all of these new uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ways that have gone beyond that proof of work, which clearly um, you know, was, uh, was anything but uh, uh, sustainable or, uh, or good for the environment. Uh, thankfully, uh, you know, we're moving into a, into a new uh, phase and uh, um, I, I like the sound of, of minting on demand, uh, and uh, you know that, that sort of eliminates all of the, um, all of the, uh, you know, all, all of those challenges that, uh, that that we've had with physical uh, art and, uh, and transportation, etc. And also, um, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the actual um, energy that it, that it takes to, uh, to to create them in the past uh, as, as proof of work sort of thing. Um, I know it's a, it's a whole new topic for, for perhaps another another panel. But yeah, this is a, this is a topic that we already have in the list, and I already I already have a couple of speakers for that topic because I'm really passionate about this topic. So yeah, this is another topic. What I said today is the first is is the start in this series about the environmental um, concern, uh, uh, yeah, concerns if you want to uh, about the art district in the in the metaverse. If you think about the, the metaverse just being like a, like a new planet that we are creating and uh, the art is just one piece of this planet. Um, but it will be also the metaverse used to sell shoes, to sell fashion, to sell all the different things. So each industry will need to look at the standards, at the ethics of uh, how they are operating on the physical world and how we, they are going to be operating in this new planet or in this new universe, if you want to um, think about it. Um, 
that uh, they already exist NFTs on demand. The only thing is, as I say, is to do all with politics. The majority of the blockchains, they don't allow to do that. The majority of them, they want you to spend the money as an artist to mean something before it's sold. So again, it's, we are talking about the conflict between politics and what is possible. And that sure. is all driven by ethics. So at the end of the day, is ethics. So I don't know, John, as you are here, and you are going to go back to sleep probably <laughs> soon, I don't know. Uh, uh, but, uh, so what I'm saying is, I don't think that you are going to be able, we are having the talk about this exhibition at um, um, it's about, uh, um, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Where are you, John? So that I have no idea. I'm really bad with the time zone, so I'm already using the time body all the time. I'm really bad with time zones. But so as you are here, if you are interested about any piece of work, um, I will be very happy to introduce you to, to that piece if you are curious about something. All these pieces here are Keith, are Keith Grafton, all this uh, photographic based work in there. My pieces are in the other wall in there, which there are the red in the background there and that wall there. So I don't know what is calling me. Uh, but I mean, the meaning of Keith's works, uh, I would say, is very powerful as well because his work is very uh, conceptual and abstract, but there's a huge meaning behind all each one of the works. So, oops, he's gone. <laughs> The same thing he says uh, for all of you that I maybe. Looking at the works there. <laughs> yeah, that's good. If you want to go to uh, room number three, there are environmental works in there. Uh, if you are interested, I mean, I know it's very late for everybody because we are already one and a half hour in this talk. Wow. Uh, if you wow. want to, yeah, on the room three, if you. In the room three, there are works about the plastics, uh, the, the things that I have found as well in the beaches and the microplastics and all that. So, that if you are interested. So cool. Hello, that, kids. That's, that's so cool, Martin, uh -oh. and uh, really, 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 uh, really happy to, uh, to to be a part of, uh, of your, uh, your, your, your your panels and Keith's uh, panel discussion. It's uh, no, thank you very much so, for uh, you know. Uh, John can, uh, can connect with you guys, and uh, you know we, we really are at uh, this this pivotal moment uh, in yeah. um, you know a new dimension in sustainable uh, you know uh, dimension uh, for, uh, for for art uh, and uh, and amplifying um, you know all of the all of the messages that uh, that, that nothing really uh, can 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 be more a uh, powerful. Um, you know, can, can can be more powerful than art to transcend. Uh, you, know, you mentioned politics and uh, and all of those things. You know, so it's uh, you know, I'm, I'm really I'm really pleased that uh, um, that you know that, that, that we're here at this moment. And uh, you know, um, great uh, uh, great great panel. Thanks for organising it. For me, the power of art is that it speaks louder than words. Yes. Because I think that when we start shouting about uh, any topic, whatever it is, we just become deaf. So when you get a piece of work that creates an emotional connection, an impact, that stays, that stays in your brain. And sometimes it can take about six months before you realize something that you had seen, before you do something about it. So the visual impact of, so, of a message, the subliminal message of a visual uh, impact, is under under underrated and underestimated and under misunderstood. So I think this is the purpose of the work that Keith and I we do is to be able to create this impression on your retina, so that talk straight to your brain. And when you are emo you are ready to take action, clarity will come to you. Great, um, absolutely. And then to eliminate uh, all of the geographical boundaries um, and uh, you know allow total inclusivity and accessibility uh through you know this technology that we're uh, that we're experiencing right now um that, uh, that will only ever i think that's only going to get uh, you know even even better and better uh yep. is uh, it's just a, a, a great uh, yeah. so i'm going to say say my goodbye to this point in time thank you for coming i appreciate it Thanks, Keith. Yeah, yeah. Thank John, John is in there. Yeah, I do relate to that. 
Yeah, we really appreciate the effort. Yeah, that's it's been really, it's been really fun being part of the whole panel and to, to be able to share some things with you and, and to hear what what it is that you have to say. And, and, and look, I, th I think it's great. It's, it's, um, uh, thanks for inviting me into the space. Yeah. I think it's um, I think it's really good because it sounds like we're all pretty much on the same page in some ways and um, um, have similar concerns about the environment about certain aspects of art and things like that and, and I think it's a great forum to be able to you know, discuss these things and I, I, I also would like how we've got a springboard into further conversations especially when we're talking about um, you know, the environmental considerations of energy production and things like this because you know, this is a great that actually well, that, 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 that excited me to be part of this space is when I heard that it was possible uh, to be able to create MFTs with a limited environmental impact. And, and, and now that I know that it is possible from, from the conversations that I've had, it, it's yeah, it is possible. Always, it is possible. Yeah, and, and we will do, we will do a panel. Yeah, you go, Keith, you go. You go. You go, Keith. Let's go. Uh, yeah, so we, it's what he said. We will do a talk about how to create environmental things because it is possible, but people are not aware of it. It's like every single thing in every conversation is that whoever speaks louder is the only person who's listened. But there is a lot of quiet conversations that exist, and I think that as we become aware of that, we need to help them to amplify them because at the end of the day, the world that we create is the result of the conversations that we have. So when you get become when people become aware of something they didn't know and they feel connected and fascinated about that, then they become very committed in order to become like a microphone to amplify that. Because we live in a world of noise and uh, it is important to be able to separate the essence from the noise. So brilliant, brilliant Mate. Um, yeah, I I I hear you and uh, yeah, wonderful. Okay, so thank you everybody for coming. If you have energy and the willingness, <laughs> uh, we are going to be back here at five o'clock. Uh, sorry, three o'clock Eastern time. No, yes, what time it is? It's about with the time. So, is, are you around? No. Uh, okay, so this was here. Yeah, three o'clock. Three o'clock Eastern time is going to be the talk about this exhibition. Uh, for you, uh, the Tiger Butterfly is nine o'clock in Europe. 8 o'clock in London, JW. Irina, I don't know where are you in the world. Where are you, Irina, in the world? I'm in California. Okay. Okay. So you are Eastern Time. So. See, that's, yeah. that's, that's the amazing, that's the amazing thing about, uh, about this. John, I know you're in that. Uh, you know, you're just coming through on the on the laptop. Um, so yeah. I'm looking forward to you experiencing this. It's easier, really isn't it? Really in the laptop, it's easier. Yeah. Don't yeah, you find it easier, John? Yeah. yeah. Three or four or five minutes away, and then I was in my office. So I'm also looking forward to that as well. But it, it, it hasn't diminished my, my, uh, my being able to be part of this, and I really appreciate you guys looking out for me and asking me whether you are and things like that. And it's been great being part of this whole conversation. Yeah, thank you for JW to introduce you. Uh, that was great. It's strange to, it's strange to JW that you are here. So thank you very much. It's great. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much. So, thank you very much for coming. Augusta, just a shout to you as well. Um, uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Man. Are you here, Agustin? Or are you here, Agustin? Or is just this Agustin? Okay, all right. I think okay, it's what they say. You never know. Who is, you see, that's the beauty of that. You can be here, but you cannot be here. And both at the same time. Isn't that great? <laughs> we are becoming omnipresent everywhere at the same time so that's fabulous <laughs> yeah the merge of reality yeah Thank it will come a time we will, right. we will ask where are we we, we will not know any, anymore so okay everybody thank you very much for coming and um see you later hopefully yeah thanks mate. if we can see yeah bye thank now you, bye thanks guys. bye john bye Uh, you need to press uh, the A and then you get to the lobby. Oops, no? Okay.
create the A, but I didn't go to the lobby. No, 